Hi, I'm Mel Majoros. I am a four-year cancer survivor. My blog, The Cancer Warrior, is one of the top 10 breast cancer blogs according to blogs.com. I'm here to bring a fresh, upbeat perspective to a topic that to some may seem scary. A positive mental attitude got me through my cancer, and I hope to share that with you. Today we are talking to author, filmmaker, and cancer survivor, Michael Solomon. How are you today, Michael? Hi, Mel. I'm fine. As you can tell, I'm in New York City. You heard your first siren. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear that. that. That could be anywhere, actually. It could have been in Beirut, for all I know. <laughs> um, so you wrote a book called Now It's Funny, How I Survived Cancer, Divorce, and Other Looming Disasters. But before we get into, you know, your, how you were diagnosed and how you found out, I need to know, is that your ass on the cover? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question I get asked the most about the book. Really? Yes, it really is. And it is your ass? Well, I suppose I should preface it with a drum roll. Oh. It's not. Oh, so you need... A, but it could be. You needed a stunt butt? It could be. You know, I certainly know the feeling of having your ass hanging out of a gown <laughs> while people can see you. So I can certainly relate to the picture on the cover. But I thought maybe I should get somebody a little better looking from behind than me. So. Oh. Well, that's unfortunate because that could, that could have been stories for your grandchildren right there. <laughs> or, or a Christmas card. I'm just saying you... Photoshop and a little Christmas hat or yarmulke, whatever, go for the season that you want. Just there you go. I'll, maybe I just have to Photoshop it to look like me now. <laughs> exactly. Not sure what I would change. Maybe take a little bit of the hair off there the top go. of his head is what I mean by that. Well, oh. okay. That's TMI, mm -hmm. but okay. So, <laughs> Michael, tell me um, how you found out you had cancer. What happened? How did that happen? I found out by accident. Oh. Yes. Okay. I When I turned 40... Or I should say, up until the years preceding when I turned 40, my father started to bother me saying, Mike, he calls me Mike. He said, Mike, you've got to get a colonoscopy when you turn 40. He told me this when I turned 36, 37, when I turned 38, <laughs> when I turned 39. My dad has a real knack for always reminding me of these kind of things. And so when I turned 40, I said, I got to get a colonoscopy to a friend of mine who was a pediatrician. And he said, oh, I've got the perfect guy to send you to. He's a, a gastro and he's terrific. And he sent me to this doctor. His name is Michael Faust. And oh. I got scared. I was like, Faust? Faust? What kind of guy is that? <laughs> doctor? <laughs> and I'll send me to Dr. Frankenstein while you're at it. Yeah, exactly. So I went to see Dr. Faust and he gave me a physical and he said to me at the end, he said, I don't know what it is with you guys. You, you turn 40 and you think something's wrong with you. And I said, there's nothing wrong with me. It's just my father was you know, very worried. There had been colon cancer in my family. My grandfather had died of colon cancer. Okay. And my aunt, who was his sister, had colon cancer as well. So he did have a reason to be concerned, although Dr. Faust told me the protocol is really for when you turn 50. Oh. But he said, anyway, I think that's the correct thing to do. I'm going to give you the colonoscopy. And then as I left his office, he said, oh, by the way, I want you to get a chest x-ray as well. And then months passed. Why, because of, why did he want you to get a chest x-ray? He didn't really say. He just said you should get a chest x-ray too. Oh. A couple months passed. I was terrified of getting a colonoscopy. I just, the whole, the whole idea of it scared me to death. I never really had that kind of medical testing before. Because you have to drink that drink? Well, you have to drink that drink, and then you have this, you know, metallic mm -hmm. intruder. Yeah. <laughs> danger, danger, Will Robinson, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> did you, I, wait, but did you get to keep the, the video? Because if you make a movie, well, we'll talk about later, you could have that as part of your... As part no, of the film. It's good to know. I, I think I've retained the rights to it, though. Excellent. Good. Yes. yes. No one has bought the rights to your colonoscopy yet. Not yet. But <laughs> if any of your listeners are out there and want to make me an offer, I'll endeavor to get an agent and we can try to work something out. <laughs> okay. So you were nervous about your colonoscopy, as everyone usually is. Terrified. Yes. So a couple of months after I got the two prescriptions, one for the colonoscopy and one for the chest x-ray, I said to myself, oh, I know what I'll do. Something positive for my health. I'll get the chest x-ray because I wasn't afraid of getting a chest x-ray. Right. So I picked up the prescription. I made an appointment. I went and I got the x-ray. And I thought, okay, that's it. And someday I'll get the colonoscopy. Well, a week after my chest x-ray, my phone rang at 9 o'clock at night. And on the caller ID, it says Michael Faust. That's never good. Never good. So uh, first I was like, should I answer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'd better answer the phone. And Dr. Faust was great. He said to me, I know I'm calling you from home. Don't be alarmed. I'm just calling because I have your chest x-ray here with me at home. 
And at that point I was like, okay, I thought to myself, it's over. He's about to tell me I'm dead. But he said, I'm just a little concerned because I think I see something on your left lung. Oh. Yeah. He said, I think it's what we call an old, might be an old granuloma. And I wouldn't worry about it. I just want you to have it checked out. I want you to have a CAT scan, but don't worry about it. It's probably nothing. <sighs> don't, uh, yeah. The problem is when you say that to an ex-smoker like me, mm -hmm. there's something, there may be something wrong with your lung. A, a wave of guilt washed over me. <laughs> right. And I thought, okay, I'm now about to pay for 20 years of smoking. Dr. Faust doesn't know that I smoked for 20 years, but you know, we may as well start to pick out a suit for me to be buried in. And I, with a great deal of trepidation, went in and had the CAT scan. Three hours after the CAT scan, he called me. And I thought, what? <sighs> yeah. And he was, his voice was trembling. Ooh. And Michael, I, I just, I'm looking at your CAT scan. And the issue is this. And as soon as I heard him say, the issue is this. Yeah, you, you're, you know. I never had an issue. <laughs> told me I didn't have an issue. What happened was there was nothing on my left lung. He thought he may have seen something. There was nothing there. Oh. But the CAT scan revealed that there was a mass on my right lung and that there was a mass on my liver. That's crazy that it wasn't, didn't show up on the x-ray. Insane. Insane. He said, Michael, I've been looking at this x-ray for, for, you know, for a week I had it at home. Now I'm looking at it again. I don't, you, you just can't see anything. There's nothing. I don't see anything on your right lung in this x-ray. But the CAT scan indicates that it's there. And your liver, I can't understand that because I just did the blood work. There shouldn't be anything on your liver. So, and, you're, and you're like, yeah, you and me both, Doc. That's right. So he sent me for... Uh, first he said, you're going to have to go to a lung specialist to figure out what's going on with your lung. And you're going to have to go get a sonogram to find out what's going on with your liver. And of course he happened to call me right when I was picking up my six year old son, <sighs> the thoughts that churned through my head right. <laughs> which are in the book, but which are also very vivid to me still today are, I can't lose this kid. I cannot, I have to, I can't, my life can't end right now. Right. So I went to get the sonogram, which was hilarious because... What is, yeah, what does a sonogram do for a liver? I mean, is that kind of like an ultrasound? It's exactly oh. what it is. Okay. It's an ultrasound. It, it enables them to see what's there. But okay. it was me and 15 pregnant women. <laughs> it's like your cancer Lamaze class or something? Right. <laughs> That, that was the, the first sort of light moment that I had. I got in there and I said, this is ridiculous. I'm here and, you know, maybe, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if I was just pregnant? Maybe that, you know, I could be pregnant like all these other women. Think of how rich you'd be right now. Instead right. of cancer, you could have That's been. right. That's right. And I could make that movie. Oh, now, Arnold Schwarzenegger made that movie already. But Well, you could make a good movie. Well. Right. <laughs> so the sonogram, in the sonogram, there was a woman there and she said, there's nothing on your liver. I'm certain of it. I've done it three times. You've got cysts on your kidney. And I was like, oh, what fresh hell? Like now I've got <laughs> kidney cancer. And she said, no, no, this is great news. When you, we don't even treat cysts on the kidney. They're very benign. We leave them alone. You worry about, worry about, about, and you don't have liver cancer. So I thought, wow, if I could just go to the lung specialist and have him tell me, you know, maybe he saw something wrong. Maybe he can give me a different test. I'm in the clear. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Right. I went to the lung specialist and... He confirmed that, in fact, what I had on my lung was a tumor wow. and that it was malignant. How big was the tumor? Three centimeters. Ooh, that's a big one. Yeah. I, and, of course, I immediately started to look on the Internet to see. Is it, oh, is don't it, ever do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I quickly learned, you know, OK, if you ever look on the internet, you're definitely going to die because there's not really any reliable information there. So. And yeah, and you know, my doctor said, I mean, it's good to look on the internet for information, but not like any 24, give yourself at least like three days before you look on the internet. Because my doctor said, don't, don't do it. Don't look on the internet. Don't try to get information. Just, you know, try to process this. And I was like, whatever. And I'm looking at all this stuff about my breast cancer. And I literally thought my head was just going to like spin around and shoot off. And oh, my, yeah. And my fiance was like, didn't she tell you not to look? And I was like, 
Newman. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't. Yeah, just, you know what, Dr. Google, Dr. WebMD, you're going to think all of a sudden you have malaria and every other disease known to man. And the worst case scenario is you. And that's not necessarily the case. Right. I'd already done that when I thought I had the granuloma and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> I want to have one of these. So I stopped looking. It's that's the best advice you can give somebody. Avoid the Internet at all costs. Yes. Although find people you want you can talk to, but don't like have them give you like, oh, yeah, my aunt Sally had lung cancer and she died. It's like, oh, isn't it funny how nobody <laughs> really knows what to say to anybody who has a cancer diagnosis unless they've had one before? I know. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Susie had a horrible time. It's like, yeah, I don't want to hear about you, Aunt Susie. I, right. I, they inevitably tell you about somebody who's died from whatever you have. I actually had somebody, an old boss of mine, who saw me in, and I still remember it to this day, and every time I see her, I'm just like, oh, my God. She's like, oh, I heard you had cancer. I'm just like, yes. Are you going to die? I'm like thinking, well, not right now. <laughs> We're here in the parking lot of the grocery store. I hope not. I'm like, are you going to die? I'm like, yeah, the doctor didn't tell me I was, so, but yeah. Right, right, right. But it's also, you know, on a deeper level, I think for me, it was really important to trust my doctors once yes. I decided I trusted them. Yes. And that's very important, too. If you don't trust your doctor, I always say find another doctor. Right, which I did, too. I went and had a second opinion, and I mm -hmm, actually switched good. doctors when it was time for me to have my first surgery. Which I thought was a, you know, worked out well fine. I think I thought it was a, the right thing to do. And it, certainly for me, it was the right thing to do. It's not necessarily for everyone because sometimes the good news is you might find out something that you didn't know before. And the bad news is you, you get, you have a very high possibility of more uncertainty. Right. Now, did you have your lung removed? I went in to have uh, what I thought was going to be a third of my right lung removed. And my surgeon, who I think was absolutely brilliant was able to remove only a small corner of my lung oh, wow. through what she called a thoracotomy. They use a thoracoscopy. It's, it's like um, an arthroscopy, but for your, for your thorax, for your chest. Mm. And that's why I had chosen her as my surgeon. There were, I'd gone to a, a surgeon before who I'm sure was an excellent surgeon, but he had never offered me that option. Oh, yeah. So I went for a second opinion and she said, yeah, I'm going to just put three holes in you and then we... I'm like, okay, well, one is for the camera and one is for the tool. What's the third one for? I thought, you know, like in film, we use a clapper, you know, that thing. That yes. <laughs> I thought, why does my surgery have to be in sync? That's funny. Yeah. Uh, we're doing a three camera sitcom on your. <laughs> <laughs> I still own the rights. I told you that at the beginning. So That's right. <laughs> so, wow, that's pretty amazing that they were able to do that. It was, it was nothing short of a miracle. I have to say, I was very, very fortunate. So how did you go from lung cancer survivor to author? I mean, did you just start writing down your, your thoughts as everything was happening? Yes. I, once I got my first diagnosis, and it really wasn't when I got my diagnosis. Once, once Dr. Faust told me I might have cancer, I started to write down what was going on with me because for some reason I felt it was, would be important not to forget. Right. Exactly. I didn't know why. So I kept very detailed notes on everything that was going on, not only in physically, but psychologically, which I think is a, one of the most under-examined areas of... Oh, yes, <laughs> it is. And in my wandering mind, you can only imagine how much stuff was going on. <laughs> so I, you know, by the end of my, by the time I had that lung surgery, I had this uh, probably you know, 100 pages of notes that I'd written about what was going on. And then I put them away happily and I thought great good riddance I never want to see these things again because my doctor told me I had an indolent lymphoma it was slow growing lucky for me so I may have to deal with it again in my life but it might be it could be 20 years before anything happened and then six months later I went in for my checkup and they found another tumor so it wasn't a slacker like you thought not at all mm. and I was angry right I was angry because I thought it was going to be 10 years before somebody told me I had another tumor. I was ready for that. I was not ready to have another tumor. So the, one of the biggest burdens that I had at that point was now I have to tell everybody. And by then there were a lot of people, my friends, my family. I got to tell them, guess what? I have another tumor. I have to go in through all these tests. We don't know what the prognosis is, et cetera, et cetera. And the burden of that was just overwhelming. 
So I wrote an email to as many people as I thought needed to know. And I said, this email is to let you know that from now on, I will send you an email and keep you up to date on everything that's going on with me medically. So you don't have to feel like you have to call me because I'm sure you can relate to this, oh. Mel. Doesn't everybody call you on the day that you have your doctor's appointment? Or the day that you're feeling the worst. Yeah. And the last, the last person who calls you is like the one who just like, gets your you're like I don't want to talk to you anymore and they have no idea that 10 other people ask how are you the, the whole like not like how are you doing but how are you feeling today how are you feeling that's a question I would <laughs> not mind never hearing for the rest of my well, life and, and the other thing is is like I've actually like counseled some friends of mine who, who uh, has a mutual friend who I didn't really know I said you know what only bring up cancer if she does only talk about it when she wants to. I mean, there were so many days when I'm sure you wanted to, Michael, that's you wanted to hear about someone's like crappy day at work or, you know, when they went out for margaritas or something and not about like, so is your hair growing back yet? It's like, oh, oh yeah. Tell me about the holes in your socks. Yes. Take my mind off <laughs> of this horror that I'm dealing with on a daily basis. Exactly. Dis distract me. Distract me. Yes. So anyway, I so the emails went out, and then I decided that was the way I would communicate. And then what ha the strangest thing happened was a few weeks after doing this, I got an email from someone I didn't know a stranger. Oh. He said, "You know, so and so, your friend forwarded me these emails that you've been writing, and I don't know how to say this, but I'm really enjoying reading about your ordeal. And I hope you don't take this <laughs> the wrong way, and I hope everything works out for you. But if you wouldn't mind, could you add me to the email list?" So I did, and then I got another email from a stranger again saying, you know, obviously, hope everything works out, and when it does, you should do something with these emails, because I was in the habit of writing everything in such detail, and I think people were just unaccustomed to that sort of, you know, hearing someone's first-person account yes. as it was happening. So I turned it into a book. Did you self-publish? Yes. I decided to self-publish. I won't bore you with the story of how I actually had somebody who wanted to publish a book, but I'm I'm really happy with the choice that I made. So, you know, we were talking about your ass on the cover. Now it's funny. And I know a, a lot of uh, cancer books, they just seem like they're written for the people who have had cancer, cancer survivors, cancer patients. Uh, now, if... If I gave this book to a friend of mine who's never had cancer, but, but who knows what I've gone through, what, what would you think about that? I think that would be great. I've done it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Giving your book to somebody? What? No. I mean, why, why would you think that it, uh, it would be good for other people? I, I tried never to forget that my job, when I decided to put on the hat that says author, I try to never forget that my job is to entertain people, to engage them, and to tell a compelling story. So the, this story, even though it is ostensibly a story about a guy who had cancer and a guy who went through a divorce and a guy who lived through 9-11 and on and on and on, it's really kind of a story about me, this person who was just scared to death and had to find a way to go on with his life. And I think that anybody can relate to that. Did you go through a divorce, 9-11, and cancer in the same year? Yeah. Did you like? I had it. My calendar was empty. So, <laughs> where did you live near uh, 9 11? Uh, did you live near the World Trade Center? I lived um, in an area called NoHo in Manhattan. Okay. It was close enough that for the next four months, we could smell the World Trade Center. Oh, wow. And it was a horrible, a horrific smell. Wow. And of course, I went down there when it happened, and then I was there the next day, and we all and we all lived it in a very intense way. And yeah, in my particular neighborhood, and of course, I knew people who were, you know, in those buildings. Unfortunately, right? Wow. Hmm. That's that's not funny, but it kind of is if you think about like all those. You know, they say bad things happen in three, so you're really set for the rest of your life. I think. <laughs> At least for that year. <laughs> At least for two thousand and one, <laughs> exactly. But. My goodness. Yeah. You know, it's funny to, I don't tend to think, oh, is this a sign of something? Although I have to say there were, there were a few moments there where I was like, you know, they say, what's that expression about God never gives you more than you can handle. And I was like, get me God now yeah. and get on the phone. We have to talk. <laughs> You're 
You're like, this is supposed to be for somebody else, not for me. Right, right. right. So with all this stuff, 9-11 and excuse me, your divorce, how do, how do you feel that you made cancer funny in your book? Because I know how cancer and, you know, the ridiculous things that happen are funny to me, but how would you, you know, give me a story, for example. Give me a for example. Okay. For example, when I was going in for my first surgery, yes, I'm sure you'll recognize this, this feeling. I was in the pre-op room. I had my mm -hmm. family around me. Mm -hmm. And then the guys came in with a gurney and they put me on the gurney and they laid me down flat and they started to wheel me to the operating room. Yes. And I had that point of view that you've seen on television so many times. <laughs> yes. where you just I was overhead lights <laughs> one at a time. And I thought, wow, this is wild. I feel like I'm on a TV show. And then I looked up and there was the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. She was one of the doctors or one of the residents. I couldn't figure out who she was. And I thought, oh, my God. I, I can't just go into surgery. I got to find out who this woman is. I got to get her phone number. I got to say, listen, I know the circumstances are a little rough, but can we maybe <laughs> afterwards get together and have a drink or something like that? And, of course, I, I've got no sense that, first of all, I'm married at this point. Right. I'm wearing a shower cap. And I've got to have a, a, the most ghostly complexion you can imagine. <laughs> But in my mind, I'm sort of this attractive guy, <laughs> and maybe she can see that. And then it dawns on me, wait a minute, why am I seeing the most beautiful woman that I've ever seen right before I'm about to go into surgery that I should live through, but you never know? I thought, maybe this is what you see before you die. You know, people talk about, you know, you see a light at the end of the tunnel, or right. she, maybe she's the angel that's going to escort me to heaven. And I started to panic. <laughs> <laughs> Stop this gurney. Don't let me in there. I've seen the angel. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And then, of course, luckily, they had very strong drugs and knocked me out. <laughs> so who was she? She was just one of the residence teams. And when I woke up, I saw her again. But something happened while I was unconscious. I think maybe my, my moral compass kicked in. <laughs> and so I was just grateful to see her, grateful to be alive, and anxious to see my family again. That, that must have been, you know, was it kind of scary and was it kind of like when you saw her again? Well, I was pretty drugged up and I do, I do remember seeing her and going, oh yeah, it's the angel. And then thinking, oh, wait a minute, my surgery is over. That's how I started to kind of piece together that my surgery was over and I was up and I obviously had survived it. So, so, so here's what I'm thinking since you're now single, right? You are, nope. you are single, right? So, no, 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 no. Uh, oh, at that point. Well, no, now, no, now I'm married. Oh, now you're married. Okay. I'm remarried. Yes. I was going to say for single people, you know how they write with Sharpie, like, you know, this, when I had my breast surgery done, they, they write, you know, they put a little thing on there or whatever. You could probably write your phone number in Sharpie <laughs> somewhere on you. So then you'd be like, you know, I'm available because that way the person will see all of you and then they can make that determination later. Just saying. Yes. I'm available and I don't normally look like this. Right. I'm not usually <laughs> naked on a metal table, but maybe we could go for coffee in a couple of days when I'm feeling a lot better. Yeah. No, it's good to write. It's, <laughs> it's good to know. That's, that's actually, I'm writing that suggestion down. I kind of like that. Excellent. Excellent. You never know. So it's just, it's just funny. I'll, give me another story of something funny that happened to you. Well, when I was seeing the lung specialist yes. for the first time, I was terrified, of course, and I was just, I thought any minute he's going to tell me you're going to die. So he brought me into his office and he had all these books stacked up oh. and papers and files. And I mean, it was the messiest office I've ever seen <laughs> on the floor, on every shelf. And I thought, this nut job is the person <laughs> I'm going to, to find out if I'm going to live or die. Like, what am I doing in here? And then he, I saw he had a sign that said something like, I'm too busy to clean up. So I thought, okay, so he at least knows that this is a really messed up office right, and that right. there should be, you know, someone should be in here, clean things. Because you, you just had the feeling that your record could be so easily misplaced. So he had one of those light boxes for looking at x-rays and CAT scans and stuff on his wall. Right. And he, you know, with the, the gravitas of a lung specialist, says, okay, Michael, uh, now let's take a look at your CAT scan. 
and he takes it and he puts it up on this light box and he, his fingers get like all fumbly and he drops <laughs> a CAT scan and it goes right behind his desk. Oh. He has that desk that you've seen in a Coen Brothers movie. You know, the one that weighs like 4,000 pounds <laughs> and it's made of like the strongest oak that ever grew on the planet and you can't possibly move it. It's probably bolted into the floor. Yes. We couldn't get the CAT scan out. Oh my gosh. So I'm like trying to find out, am I going to die? And he's like, I can't tell you. I really need that CAT scan. <laughs> so the two of us were trying to move this. It was just impossible to move. We pushed, we pulled. Finally, he called a maintenance guy and we had to wait there for 15 minutes while my life was hanging in the balance. And this guy showed up with just, a, you know, a torso the size of Cleveland and <laughs> Lifted the desk up all by himself. Oh my gosh! And pulled out the CAT scan, and then of course I got the news that oh, it's definitely a tumor, and it's probably lymphoma. You're like, are you sure that's mine? That someone else's didn't fall back. Okay, in? Let's put the desk back and maybe <laughs> yeah, rearrange it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Now, now you said you were thinking about making this into a movie. How is that going? Very well. Yeah. There's a lot of interest. Excellent. I got a phone call yesterday as a matter of fact, about turning this into a movie. And I've also had interest um, from producers about turning this into a play, like oh. a you know a stage play. Very nice. Yeah, both of which I think I'm going to do. Now, would you do the one-man show? I, it's, it's good that you asked me that because I was sort of asking myself that same question. I'm not, by nature, a performer. Mm -hmm. I'm used to being behind the camera. I'm not opposed to the idea of doing it, but... I think there's a universal quality to my story there that is. people can really relate to. So if I develop it, or I should say when I develop it into right. a play, I'd like to develop it into something that other people can perform. So you can judge them instead of other people judging you. Exactly. I can say, it's not me, it's that guy. <laughs> He's the guy. Believe me, that guy's married. He shouldn't be looking at that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, would you have casting sessions where you have to look at someone's butt? You know, this, it's, I told you, the butt, it's, I cannot believe the importance that this butt has assumed over time. But, yeah, absolutely. Every, every detail matters, as they exactly. say. So who would play you in the movie? If, if you could, if you just walked into, say, Paramount Pictures and they said, here you go, you could get any movie actor that you wanted to play you, who would it be? But, well, with, but with standing. Like, the, the, the answer that everyone wishes, every man wishes he could give is Brad right 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 Russell well, Crowe mm -hmm. somebody handsome and full of self-confidence I think I my character tends more towards the neurotic end so I think more like a Paul Rudd mm -hmm. Jesse Eisenberg Woody Allen hello who wants to see Woody Allen in a movie anymore no, I love Woody Allen or or in a hospital gown for that matter <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Richard Lewis. Right there. Good. Sure. Sure. Wow. See? That, and you could get just your, you know, introducing some new actress, and that could be her, like, it role. You know? It could happen. That's or, the, that's or you could the have Angelina Jolie as, you know, as the angel. Angelina Jolie right, as the angel. <laughs> I'd rather have Angelina Jolie as the butt that we see. but There uh, you go. Yeah. That would be awkward, though. That might be a whole other book, <laughs> if it's you. <laughs> <laughs> now it's not only funny, it's uh, cute. Ex exactly. Well, unbelievably, we're almost out of time, Michael, so I want you to tell me how uh, people can find you on the internet, Facebook, and that kind of thing. Okay. They can f go to my website, which mm -hmm. is nowitsfunny.com. They can look me up on Facebook. My name is Michael Solomon. I don't have a, that's my name on Facebook. <laughs> I have, a, I also have, a, there's also a fan page for the book called Now It's Funny. Are you on Twitter? I am. At Now It's Funny. Excellent. So they can find you and they can buy your book on any of those places? They can buy the book, not on my Facebook page. I have to figure out how to do that. But they can, <laughs> they can buy the book on my website. Excellent. They can buy the book on Amazon. They can buy the book on Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Kobo. Awesome. Hmm. So buy the book and uh, read it before the movie comes out. Because we'll see Angelina Jolie on the movie poster. 
I like your idea, Mel. I have to say, as soon as we're done, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get on the phone and see if we can make that happen. That would be awesome. I just want to just fly me out for the premiere. That's all I ask. You got it. And I've now said that in front of an audience. <laughs> <laughs> you can take well, me to task. <laughs> exactly. Well, hang on, uh, Michael. I'm going to wrap up like I usually do. This is Mel Majoris. I am the Cancer Warrior. You can always find me on Facebook because I am a Facebook junkie. Become a fan of the show on Facebook, The Cancer Warrior on EmpowerRadio.com. The Cancer Warrior is also available on iTunes and on the podcasts app on your iPhone. And check out my award-winning blog, thecancerwarrior.blogspot.com. And as always, life looks pretty good from where I'm sitting. Sending you good vibes. It's The Cancer Warrior on EmpowerRadio.com.